Are you always wondering about the things around you? Do you always have the need to find out? Then, this is the show for you. Learn what makes things tick. Or how they simply came to be. Satisfy your curiosity. Welcome to another episode of Curious. Aerobics. It's a popular exercise that anybody can pick up and move to the beat. Pick up your dancing shoes and get your gym wear ready. Let's talk about aerobics. But first, let's find out what it means. Scientifically speaking, the word aerobic means with oxygen or in the presence of oxygen. You could say that biological processes that are aerobic require the use of oxygen. Well, that's exactly what happens when we breathe. The oxygen is carried around our body using our blood, and we use up this oxygen to perform bodily tasks. Here's where aerobics comes in. During the 1960s, U.S. Army physiologist Dr. Kenneth Cooper and physical therapist Colonel Pauline Potts originally developed aerobics as a form of exercise to be used by the U.S. Army as part of their training. Dr. Cooper, an avid exercise enthusiast, developed the regimen in response to an observation that he had. He noticed that some people who had great muscle strength fared poorly when it comes to activities that require exertion for longer periods of time, like swimming, biking, and hiking. Using a bicycle ergometer for tests, he found out that the inability to perform sustained tasks was directly linked to how a person's body processes oxygen. In 1968, the book Aerobics was published and it contained specific exercises like biking, swimming, and walking, all designed to train the body to use oxygen more effectively. In 1982, a video series popularized aerobics even more as it was hosted by 80 star Jane Fonda. The workout series incorporated exercise movements set to a danceable beat. This spurred not only a fashion trend but also another development for aerobics exercise, giving it a fun and fresh spin that is easy to pick up and learn. By this time, aerobics would typically be held in groups or classes where an instructor would lead the class in exercise, usually set to a very up-tempo pace of music. The entire workout routine would typically be short bursts of dance movements designed to help with one's flexibility, muscle strength, and endurance. Practitioners can choose their intensity level as specific classes are built for different age and fitness groups. An aerobic session would include five different sections. The first, of course, is the warm-up section, which consists of mainly stretching and other flexibility exercises, and lasts around 5 to 10 minutes. Then comes cardio exercise, designed to help keep the heart fit and also designed to boost metabolism and endurance. Then there's a muscle and strength conditioning, followed by a cool-down session and some light stretching. The whole thing lasts for about 40 minutes to an hour. Of course, you don't need to go to the gym. The great thing about aerobics is that it can be done anywhere, indoors, outdoors, or even in your room. Fingernails There are more than just the coverings found in your fingers and toes. Today, we'll be discussing about the human fingernail. The fingernail is a hard outer covering of the top of our fingers and toes, and is also similarly found in other primate species as well. Fingernails closely resemble claws in other animal species. It is primarily made up of the protein keratin, which is formed from dead skin cells. From an evolutionary standpoint, Fingernails may have been the evolved form of claws for the human and primate species. Somewhere along the line, our evolutionary ancestors may have ditched the claws that they use for hunting and climbing for more imaginable nails. The following are a few of the most practical features that nails provide us. Number 1. 
They provide a protective layer over our fingertips and even our toes. Fingernails act as a barrier between the actual soft fleshy tips from making contact with hard surfaces and textures which can be potentially harmful to our uncovered fingers. Number 2. Fingernails allow us to have better grip for smaller and thinner objects. When you press your fingers nail to nail, you form a sort of tweezer or a small vise. This will allow you to pick up very small objects like screws and threads. This feature also allows us to pluck fine objects like hairs and cuticles. This also suggests that nails may have evolved to allow humans to have finer and better gripping actions. Fingernails also provide us with similar features from claws, which is especially helpful for scratching and similar actions. Number 4. Fingernails also allows us to use it as a wedge to open up small crevices. Despite being hard and durable, our fingernails are not indestructible. This means that our nails must also be maintained and cared for. You probably are familiar with nail maintenance, especially with the use of a nail cutter. In some instances, nail maintenance also have an aesthetic side to it with stylish manicure and pedicure procedures that come along with it. Doctors also caution us from having dirty and unkempt nails as the small spaces between our fingers and nails may be a hotbed for germs and bacteria if not properly maintained. This may spread germs and bacteria to everything that we touch including our food and the people around us. In some instances, Nails can even be infected if kept unclean for longer periods of time. So always keep your nails clean and groomed. If you suspect any irritation or infection, it's always best to consult a doctor. And remember, you don't need to spend extra to maintain your nails. Using a good old trusty nail cutter every few weeks will do the trick. Video Games Admit it, you probably played a video game once in your life. Video games have been around since the early 70s and have steadily been on the rise ever since. A video game is an electronic game that has a human input device, your controller, and the means to display audiovisual content or a screen and some speakers. The first video game probably came out around the 1950s. Computer engineers would at the time often experiment with programming code and would write games in their spare time. Most of the games during this time were very primitive and were not released publicly as the technology in most computer labs were too expensive at the time. Come the 1960s, the prototype for the world's first home console started development. This would see its debut in 1972 as the first video game home console known as the Magnavox Odyssey. This would be followed in 1977 by the launch of the Atari 2600, which is remembered for the insanely popular Space Invaders series. In the 1980s, a Japanese company, Nintendo, released the family computer, which is also known as the Nintendo Entertainment System in North America. This was also around the time when a rival company from North America known as Sega would emerge and go head-to-head -head with Nintendo. Both would go on and develop newer systems like the SNES and Genesis, as well as portable handheld devices like the Game Boy and the Game Gear. In 1994, multimedia company Sony would join the video game industry with the release of the Sony PlayStation, a CD-powered video game console that boasted of a faster processor and improved 2D and 3D graphics that were not seen at the time. Also, around this time, computers or PCs would also be become a viable platform for video games as well. The early 2000s would give rise to online multiplayer games, where users could interact and play with gamers from around the world via the internet. In 2006, Nintendo would once again create history as they introduced wireless motion controls with their new flagship system, the Nintendo Wii. Following the footsteps of Nintendo, both Sony and Microsoft would also come up with motion controls for their own systems to varying results. It's also during this time that the rise of mobile smartphones 
would also see the release of video games designed to be played with touchscreen controls. Today, another development in gaming is approaching, the virtual reality display. VR games were attempted during the 90s, but the expensive costs during the time meant that they could not be afforded by the public. Advances in technology with the Oculus Rift, as well as smartphone VR glasses, are ushering in a type of video game that immerses players in the game's environment. EDM It's all of the dance and grooving music combined. EDM or electronic dance music is a catch-all term for all the electronically produced danceable tunes that we listen to. It's not so much a genre in itself, but is more accurately a description of music production methods. One of the clearer unifying elements in EDM is the extensive use of non-acoustic instruments and electronically assisted composition via the use of synths, sequencers, modules, computers, and the like. That's not to say that EDM exclusively uses just electronics, as vocals and real instruments are also used in EDM tracks as well. In EDM, there's also a focus on the role of the DJ as an artist. The DJ's role is expanded from playing records live on a dance hall to the creative force behind the track, producing music from composing to arranging and even mixing their own original tracks. Let's check out some of the more popular styles of dance music. Disco Although dance and music have gone hand in hand through various cultures in history, Disco is considered to be the first commercially successful form of dance music in the 70s. Disco is responsible for the rise of dance halls and clubs. Originally played live with a very funk and blues influence, the practice of playing disco music from records became a staple in clubs and dance halls and is partly responsible for the emergence of disc jockeying or DJing, which is a major component of modern dance music. House during the 1980s, DJs started incorporating new electronic production methods. They played and remixed the then disco sound and produced tracks with electronic drum beats and bass synthesizers. Most notable of the time were the Roland 303 for the bass sounds and the Roland 808 for the drums. House also features minimalistic vocals, a contrast to other types of genres where vocals are front and center. Drum and bass a product of the 1990s rave culture. Drum and bass featured faster tempos and the characteristic sub-bass sound, a synthesized bass playing octaves below standard frequencies. This resulted into a thumping bass sound that can literally be felt. Drum and bass also featured breakbeats throughout. Dubstep Formed in the late 1990s, Dubstep is a mid-tempo type of music that features syncopated beats and breakbeats and a characteristic wobble bass, a bass that is passed through a high-frequency filter back and forth. As the technology and music progress, today's EDM have branched to more sub-genres and fusion genres, some even making its influence felt in today's modern pop music. Toilet. Every home should have one. It's that other thing in your bathroom. Join us as we talk about the modern toilet. Before the invention of toilets, humans had to devise a variety of ways to get rid of human waste. One of the most common and simplest solutions was of course the latrine, a hole that is dug deep in the ground where people could do their business. Other solutions aren't that advanced and fancy as well. A container is sometimes used, but this had to be emptied a lot. The Greeks were the first to come up with sewage systems that were built under the streets connected to houses and buildings. In ancient China, early outhouses were built with outlets directly going out to pigs' ties. While in other regions in the west, cesspits were dug beneath houses as waste catch basins. While these solutions may have worked, there was still the problem of sanitation. When using these types of toilets, airborne and waterborne diseases were prevalent because of the lack of sanitation. 
the modern toilet would not be invented until around the 1500s, but its use and widespread adoption would not be commonplace until the turn of the 19th century, when rapid urban development created the modern plumbing and sewage systems necessary for homes to have flush water toilet systems installed. How does a modern toilet work? Today's toilets are made of porcelain. There's an upper tank called the water closet where the water for flushing is stored. A handle connected to an internal flapping mechanism is used to release the water. When the handle is turned, the opening is unblocked and water inside the closet quickly rushes down to the bowl below. This pushes the wastewater to the inside of an S-shaped path that leads directly to a drain connected to a septic tank. This S-trap makes sure that the wastewater goes down and does not mix with new clean water. This also makes sure that fumes from the flushed waste do not come back up the bowl as it will be blocked with a fresh refill of clean water. Meanwhile, back in the tank, the flapper reseals the water outlet and the float mechanism measures the water level inside the closet. This float mechanism turns on an inlet that replenishes water in the tank or water closet. When the water reaches the proper height and volume, the float mechanism shuts the water input line and the tank is ready to flush again. But it goes without saying that the refilled water, although new and clean, should not be touched as bacteria from fecal matter may still contaminate it. Also, throwing unnecessary items in the toilet may cause it to clog and mess up your bathroom with toilet water. So it's best to avoid that as well. Playing Cards It's known as a pack, a deck, and other names around the world. They are playing cards, a set of 52 cards that make up a deck. There are a multitude of ways, and I mean a multitude of games and variations that can be played with this one pack. It's also popularly associated with fortune telling and magic tricks. Today, let's take a look at playing cards. Playing cards had their start in China during the Tang Dynasty. A set of 32 marked paper cards were said to be the precursor to the modern playing cards of today. The history is a bit blurry. Some claim that cards may have been made of paper as a form of paper money or play money, while others claim that the cards were more like wooden blocks much closer to dominoes. Over the years, it's theorized that the cards and the games may have been picked up by other nations like Persia, India, and Egypt due to trade involvement in the Silk Road. In Persia, these cards were known as Ganjifre and had eight suites as a variation of the Chinese cards picked up from the Silk Road. The Mughal conquest would then bring the card game to India, where it was known as Ganjifa. This version stands out by having as much as 8 to 32 suites depending on the variation. As the 11th century came, the playing cards made its way to Egypt, where they are known as Mamluk. The Mamluk deck was said to be the foundation of the modern playing cards we have today. The Mamluk was the first to have intricate and distinct designs for each suite, although they did not depict persons but instead featured abstract art for each suite. In the following centuries, the Mamluk deck influenced the early European versions of playing cards. Different places in Europe would have different names for each suite, as well as a different design. Perhaps the most popular deck that we know of is the French style deck. This is where the cards that we have today are based on. This set features four suits, hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades each having 13 cards per suite, ranging from the king, queen, jack, along with 10 descending ranks, each giving a grand total of 52 cards, although sometimes a joker card is added in as well. From the simple deck evolved countless games of varying complexity. Simple games like fish can be played by kids to the more advanced games like poker and blackjack. Today, playing cards continues to be a loved pastime. The casino and gaming industry also owes a good fraction of its revenue from card games. Some of the more popular playing card games like poker have spawned international sporting leagues and events.
plastic. Plastics are around us. That's for sure. In fact, if you look around your surroundings right now, there's a good chance that you'll see something that is made from plastic. A bag perhaps, a cup, a container. Today, let's talk about the material called plastic. The term plastic actually comes from the Greek plastikos, meaning capable of being molded. Plastics are a wide range of synthetic and semi-synthetic compounds that are malleable and is able to be molded into shape. In ancient times, the first plastics to be used were organic and naturally growing substances like gum, shellac, and animal horns. The first synthetic plastics came around during the 1800s. One of the first developed was called Parksine, developed by Alexander Parks in 1856. Bakelite The first fully synthetic plastic was developed in the 1900s by Leo Bakelite. This would be followed by the development of other types come the 1940s. The way plastic stuff is made usually involves extrusion machines that inject a liquefied chemical solution to casting or molding machines. Sometimes, dyes will be added to the plastic to produce a desirable color, although some clear plastics are made transparent for specific uses. The following are some of the most common plastics that are in use today. See if you spot anything familiar. Polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, used in bottles, jars, and microwavable packaging. High-density polyethylene, or HDPE, used in detergent bottles, milk jugs, and molded plastic cases. Polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, plumbing pipes and guttering, shower curtains, window frames, and flooring. Polystyrene, or PS, packaging foam or peanuts, food containers, plastic tableware, disposable cups, plates, CD, and cassette boxes. Polyamides, or nylons, fibers, toothbrush bristles, tubing, fishing line, low-strength machine parts, under-the-hood car engine parts, or gun frames. Polycarbonate, or PC, compact discs, eyeglasses, riot shields, security windows, traffic lights, and lenses. Now despite the benefits, plastics also pose a threat to the environment. Some plastics contain toxins and harmful chemicals that can harm animals and humans, although there are initiatives being taken to have these types of plastics banned. Plastics are also responsible for generating a huge amount of non-biodegradable waste that is filling up our landfills. But there is something that we can do about it. Recycling programs are everywhere. You can contact your local government to see how you can help. You can also make small steps at home by upcycling, recycling your used plastic into new and usable things. You've just seen another fun and informative episode from Curious. As always, if you have the questions, then we're here with the answers. Stay inquisitive and stay informed. Catch us again next time on Curious.